Today is all about formulae. Formulae is the plural of formula. So it's lots of formula. Okay. So let's have a look at what we're going to do. Today we're going to do three things with formula. We're going to derive formula. Deriving formula is going from a bunch of words into something that looks like we can use it in maths. Okay. We're then going to substitute numbers into formula. Sometimes this is nice and straightforward and all the numbers are on the same side of the equation and it's great. Other times they'll give you a number on the wrong side of the equation and you have to move things around to solve it. Finally, we're going to change the subject of a formula. Sometimes the subject of the formula is a thing that's on its own and they want you to swap things around. So we're going to do that. So today is all about this. Tomorrow we're going to look at arguments and supporting arguments. We're going to prove people wrong. So you can use algebra to support and construct arguments. And then the final thing we're going to do tomorrow is, for a lot of you, I'm going to give you a past paper, not as an exam or a test, but to touch and feel and look at. There are three questions for you to start with. Things we've done in the past that I would like you to have a go at because we're going to use them today. So, what do the following mean? In other words, what's the longhand for this, this and this? What is the product of 5 and 9? That's going back to week 1. And then, if A is equal to 30B plus 10, what is A when B is 5? Okay. So the first one then, what does A with the little 3 mean? What's that all about? A times A times A. Brilliant. Yeah? It means A cubed, and that means A times A times A. Everybody happy with that? <coughs> Number of people that say it's 3 times A, you wouldn't believe. Okay? Let's nail this basics. This one, what does that mean? A is, is greater than 3. A is greater than 3. Yeah? Did that last week, inequalities. So can A be 3? No. Can it be 4, 5, 6 and so on? Good. This one here, A over B. Brilliant. In algebra, you will never see A divided by B written like that. The way they show you divisions in algebra is something over something else. It's written in fraction form, we call it. Okay? What's the product of 5 and 9? Anybody? Brilliant. Well, remember, James, it's 5 times 9, which is 45. Okay? The product is the outcome of multiplying two numbers. The reason I've written that up there is because they will use words like the sum of something, the difference, the product, when they're giving you these formula questions to go from words into formula. They're going to use all those buzzwords we talked about in week one. If A equals 30, B plus 10, what is A when B is 5? So back a few weeks to substitution, what do I need to do there? Good, so we're swapping the B, the letter B, for the number 5. That's what it's telling me to do. So 30B means 30 times whatever B is. So 30 times 5 is 150, plus the 10 at the end means A is equal to 160. Everyone happy with that? Bread and butter, nice couple of marks. No brains. So we're going to move on to formula today. What is a formula? We've talked about it. It's one of the four things I told you you had to remember. A term, an expression, an equation, and a formula. There were four things you had to commit to memory. So what's a formula? E equals mc squared. Yeah. E equals mc squared. So why is this a formula and not an equation? Because it's brilliant. You can't solve it. So formulas tend to have more than one variable. So last week we were solving lots of things because there was one variable in our equation. A formula has two variables. So unless you give me some more information, I can't do anything with a formula. What is it you, you is it energy equals mass the energy of something is equal to the mass of the object times the speed of light squared. Yeah. Okay. So that's what e, MC, e equals mc said is. I can't do anything with it until you tell me how much something heavy is. I know what the speed of light is, I just don't know what the mass of the object is. So you can't do anything with a formula until somebody gives you a bit more information, okay? So the first thing we're going to have to do with formulas is derive them, okay? You have to go from words into something that looks like maths. So let me use a really basic example for you. Is everybody happy that the area of a rectangle is the width multiplied by the length? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So the area of a rectangle is the width times the length, yeah? In words, that's what it would look like. I would say the area of a rectangle is the width multiplied by the length. To represent this in maths as a formula, because I don't know what my width is, I don't know what my length is, I can't tell you what the area is, so it's a formula. The area is equal to the width times the length, becomes A, stands for area, equals WL. W and L are stuck together because they're being multiplied, and we don't do that in maths. Maths. We don't write W times that, we write WL, yeah? So, from this really basic example, I've gone from words into something that looks like a formula, something I can use in maths. Does that make sense? Yeah. What we need to do is practice this quite a bit. And the problem is, I have no idea how they're going to give you formula in the exam. It could be V equals MC squared, area equals width times length, V equals IR, there's millions of formula I can't even begin to imagine. So what we're going to try is the technique of reading something and turning it something into a formula or something I can use in maths. So here's an example. To change the distance in miles to kilometres, we use this rule. First, multiply the miles by 8 and then divide by 5. So, what's the first thing I do to my miles? I've got M is miles, so it's telling me in words what to do to it. Good. It's saying multiply the number of miles by 8, so it becomes 8M. And then the next thing, divide whatever I get by 5, and it gives me the number of kilometres. So we've gone from words into something that looks like a formula. I can't do anything with it because I haven't got enough information. However, the second part of the question gives me that information. If I do 300 miles, how many kilometres have I done? Good, so 300 times 8 divided by 5 equals the number of kilometres. So we're just using substitution, okay? 5 goes into 30, 6 times with another 0. Multiply 60 by 8 and you get 400 and 80 kilometers. Here's another one. Let's talk about it. How do we form a formula for this? Private maths lessons cost 20 pounds an hour, plus a fixed fee of 50 pounds for admin costs. Use H for the number of hours of the lesson and the cost C. Write a formula in terms of C and H. Good. So why have you done that then, James? So James gone straight in and said 20H. Why? Yeah. Good. So for every hour, I have to multiply it by 20. So 20H is where we start. Can people see that? Good, because it's a one-off charge of 50 pounds. So if I have zero hours, I still pay an admin charge of 50. If I do 100 hours, I still pay an admin charge of 50. Yeah? And then... That's equal to C. Does that look familiar? Remember a couple of weeks ago, gradients and y-intercepts? That's the gradient, 20. That's the y-intercept, 50. Here's one for you to have a go at. Just spend two minutes looking at this and write down the equation for two bananas at H pence and three grapefruits at K pence when the total cost is one pound 36. Two bananas at H pence. I don't know what how much pence is, so what do I do to it? What's it telling me to do to the H? Yeah, two. Yeah, you've got to multiply it by two. So when it's talking about the bananas, I don't know how much the bananas are, but however much they are, I have to multiply by two. Then what do I have to do? I've got three grapefruit at K pence. Yeah, I'm three. Brilliant. So Andre's seeing this, and that's equal to one pound thirty-six. Good. So my two bananas at H pence, my three grapefruit at K pence, and that's equal to one pound thirty-six. Can't solve it because I don't. I need to know one of these two to help me out. In some exams, they lead you into doing things with questions that are broken up into bits. So here's question eight from an exam that says write down the algebraic expression for 5 more than x. So if I've got x, what's 5 more than x? So if I've got a number x, I don't know what the number is, the number that is 5 more than it is the number I started with 
plus 5, or this is going to be painful. The next part of the question is where it starts to get tricky. I use x to represent my age. My brother is five years older than me. Ring any alarm bells? The sum of our ages is 111 years old. Write an equation using this information. So let's think about it. How old am I? What else do I have to add to my age to work out my brother's age? So what's my brother's age? Not just five, it's it's my age plus five, he's older than me. So if my age is x, my brother's age is x plus five. And that's equal to 111. Can you see how we got that? I can simplify this, what's a, x plus x? 2x. 2x plus 5 equals 111 is how you would tidy that up for the examiner. Let's go on to the next part of the question. So the next part of the question then says work out my age. So we've worked out 2x plus 5 equals 111. Does it look familiar? It's a two-step equation, brilliant. What's step one? Can everyone see that from last week? Yes, yeah, step one, we minus the 5 from both sides. So I end up with 2x equals 106. What's step two? Divide both sides by 2, x equals 53. So my age is 53. Okay. Something quite topical, thunder and lightning and storms. To calculate how far a storm away is away, you count the number of seconds between the lightning and then the thunder, not the other way around. Okay? It says, to work out the distance, divide the distance, so use S to stand for the number of seconds, so divide the number of seconds by 5 and it will give you the distance. So all those words literally means divide the seconds by 5 to give you the distance. You divide by 5. Yeah. yeah. So if I say I counted 10 seconds between the lightning and the thunder, and you have to do it that way around, then you end up with 10 divided by 5 is 2 miles away. Let's talk about substitution. So we've done a bit of deriving. We'll do some more in a minute for you to practice. Okay? The way you get good at it is practice, really. So let's go back to our example question. Okay? Area is width times length. Area equals WL, width times length. In substitution, they can give you easy substitutions to do and difficult ones to do. This is the easy one. If they say the width is 5 and the length is 8, what's the area? You swap the width, which is W, for 5, the length for 8, so WL means multiply, and you end up with 5 eighths are 40. Are you happy with that? What they can also do when you've got a formula is give you a formula that's slightly trickier to come up with. So here they're saying the area is 24, and that's equal to the width times a length of 6. Good. So you divide both sides by 6, and the width is 4 metres, or whatever it is. So can you see, when you have a formula, they don't have to give you everything neatly on one side. It can be on the other side. And I'll show you some of the consequences of that. Here's a very similar question to the one we did earlier. Windsurfing lessons cost £15 an hour, plus a fixed fee of £20. So you have a go at writing down the cost of my windsurfing lessons that is equal to something. And we did one very, very similar earlier with the maths lesson. Did anybody get this? The cost is 15 times H, so 15 pounds an hour, plus 20, yeah? What we, they will then go on and do and say, something to do with substitution. How much does it cost for six hours of windsurfing lessons. Good, 15 times 6 is what it becomes, which is 90, plus the 20 gives me 110 pounds. To show you the other way around, you've just worked this out, exactly the same question, 15H plus 20 is my cost. But this time they say, I've got 170 quid in my pocket. How many hours of windsurfing lessons can I get? You substitute it and see what you end up with. So swap the cost for 170. Does it look familiar? Does that look familiar? 
take 20 from both sides, I end up with 150 equals 15H. Divide by 15 on both sides. Funnily enough, 150 divided by 15 is 10. So I can have 10 hours of lessons. BMI, what's a BMI? A body mass index. What's a body mass index? Um, it's the weight to height ratio. Good, and what's a healthy BMI? 20 to 25. Time is perfectly correct. It's a ratio of weight to height, but it's the weight divided by your height squared. It's a body mass index. There's no reason why the exam, they couldn't say, right, a body mass index is calculated with this, and then give you something to substitute in there to work out whether somebody's healthy or not. The healthy range for a BMI is 20 to 25. If you're below that, you're underweight. If you're above 25, you're overweight. So I want you to work out, is this guy fit, unfit, healthy, not healthy? So here, I'm saying I'm two meters tall and I weigh 80 kilos. So to calculate this guy's BMI, what's the first thing I do? Swap the W for 80. 80. Good, so two times two, which gives us four. 80 divided by four gives us a BMI of 20, and he's healthy. Here's a question for you to do then. Okay, don't care how you do it. I'm going to show you how to do this using formula. This is a question for an exam converting Celsius to Fahrenheit. So let's turn this into a formula. I've got Celsius, and what does it tell me to do with Celsius first? Double it. So how do I double C? Times two. So two C, and then what do I do to it? Add 30. And what's that equal to? Fahrenheit. So the formula for Celsius to Fahrenheit is multiply it by 2 and add 30, and that's going to give me that. So in the first one, I'm swapping C for 20. So 2 times 20 is 40, plus the 30 equals 70. And none of you struggled with that because you started here and you just did what it said in the box. Perfect. But you've dropped, so a lot of you have dropped two marks because you haven't done the second bit. If you'd have done this, you could do the second bit really quickly, because I'm swapping the 56 for F. So it becomes 2C plus 30 equals 56, because I've got Fahrenheit. Does it look familiar? Take away 30 both sides, as James says, leaves us with 2C equals 26. Divide both sides by 2, C equals 13. Yeah, it's the function machine. What's the first thing I do? What's the second thing I do? When I come back the other way, what's the first thing I do? What's the second thing I do? So if I have 56 and take away 30, I end up with 26. I then divide it by 2, I end up with 30. The worksheet I'm handing out now has 10 worded questions to convert formula into equations and then be able to solve them. If you struggle with this, please see the YouTube video that I've prepared. Okay, at the start of the lesson, we said that this lesson is for units two and three, didn't we? Formula applies to unit two and three. And I said at the start that in unit three, they'll do it with shapes, always. When we come onto shapes in March, I'm gonna remind you about this bit of the lesson today. And that is the fact that you can give perimeters for shapes and areas for shapes with letters, algebra, okay? So, I've got a rectangle, and I want to know what the perimeter of my rectangles is in terms of A. What's a perimeter? Everyone happy with that? The perimeter is the distance around the outside. Think of a, an army guard guarding his perimeter. He walks around the outside or something. That's exactly what we do with this. So pick a start point, let's say here, and walk your way around your perimeter so you don't miss anything. So if I got there, I've got A. What do I do to it? Add A plus 3. And then when I come down the other side, add an A again. And then when I come along the bottom, add A plus 3. Everyone happy with that? Brilliant. Then we simplify it. 4A plus 6. So the perimeter of my rectangle in terms of A is 4A plus 6. Can you see what we've done there? 
I'll remind you of this in March, but I'm doing it now because we're hot on, on this bit. What they'll then say is, John, who's building a chicken coop, and this is the perfect dimensions for a chicken coop, has got 46 meters of chicken wire. How long is length A? So guess what we do to this? Good. You turn it into an equation that we can solve. So this was an expression, there was no equal sign. We turn it into a formula with our 46 meters of chicken wire over here. What do I do to solve it? Minus six. Minus six on both sides, I've got 4a equals 40. Divide four by the sides and I end up with a equals 10. So this is 10 meters long, this is 13, this is 10, this is 13, and that's how we use this 46 meters of chicken wire. Does that make sense? So can you see the relationship now between algebra and something we'll cover in the future? On Last bit of today is rearranging formula. Okay, so we've derived formula, we've done substitution in formula. What we might be asked to do in the exam is this thing called rearranging formula. It's no different from what you did last week in so much as you're trying to get something on its own. That's how we turn it into a subject. The fact that we haven't got a number on the other side, but we've got another letter, is irrelevant. Don't let it panic you. Oh, you're doing it in engineering. Right. So let me show you how we do basic rearranging of formulas. Okay? I've got A plus 2 equals B, and I want to make A the subject. So how do I get A on its own? Can everyone see that? Yeah? So I've got A plus 2. If I take away 2 that side, I need to take it away that side. So I end up with A equals B minus 2. You happy with that? Yeah. So it's trans trans uh, formation of a formula. Yeah, it's basically transformation of a formula, but we're using the processes we learned last week. Yeah. So basically, to get something on its own, you do the opposite. So here I've got a minus two. So how do I get a on its own? I plus two on each side. So I've now got a equals b plus two. Yeah. The fact that there's no number on this side is irrelevant. You've got b and you take away two, so it's b minus two. You've got b and you're adding two, it's b plus two. Here's a trickier one then. I've got a plus c equals b. I want a on its own. So what do I need to do? Good. So if I take away c on both sides, I'm left with a, and here I've got b minus c. That's what it says on the tin. Yeah? So now we've got a as the subject. Let's look at trickier things, multiplying and dividing. I've got 2a. How do I get a on its own? Good. I do the opposite. I divide by 2. So now I've got a on its own. It's equal to b over 2. Can't do anything with it. It just lives like that. Good, I've got a divided by 2 equals b. So to do the opposite, we multiply both sides by 2. So now I've got a equals... Ah, good. You're remembering, and that's the one they like to give you because they're trying to trick you. It's 2b. Let's finish with this one then. ac equals b. Divide by what? Good. So because ac means a times c, the opposite of multiplying by c is to divide by c. So a divided by c, do the same the other side. So a is now on its own, and it's equal to b divided by c. Can you see what we did there? That's a really easy one for you. I'll give you a harder one in a minute. Okay. So rearrange p equals q plus 12 to make q the subject. So how do I get q to be the subject? Minus 12 on both sides. So what's q equal to? A equals 2R plus 4. So I want you to rearrange it to make R the subject. So you take it and divide, so it would be, you take 4, so it would be A take 4 divided by 2 equals R. So the first thing that you do on a two-step equation is take 4 from both sides. So, so now when you write it out neat, you end up with A minus 4 yeah. equals 2R. Okay. And what's the next thing I do? So if I divide both sides by 2, I have to divide all of the other side by 2. So it's a minus 4, all divided by 2, equals r. Okay? So have faith in what you're doing. The fact that there isn't a number on this side doesn't matter. Okay? The process is still the same. Last one. Well, no, second to last one. And then there's an exam question after this. 
So have a go at this one. Use that same process we've just used and see if you can come up and make V on its own. What's the first so step? You plus the two. You plus the two on both sides because it's a three step equation. So what do I now end up with on the left? So yeah, the plus two. Equals? V over three. So V over three means V being divided by three. So what do we need to do? Yeah. Times, it. Times it by? Three, good. Yeah, a bit of confidence. So if I multiply that side by three, I've got to multiply this side by three. I've got three, and I've got to multiply everything on this side. So what's the way to multiply everything by three? Yeah, If you put what's over here in brackets, when you multiply this side by three, all you need to do is go three brackets W plus two. Right, last question of the day. So. S equals 3T plus 4. For two marks in an exam, June 2012. Question 16, it's miles into the exam. It's probably the last question of the exam. Get me two marks from that. So what's step one to doing this? Nice. Brilliant. Listen in. We're just going to cover this. So Lewis says, take away four on both sides. So now what have I got on the left-hand side? S minus four. And on the right? Brilliant. And so to get t on it, so if I divide this side by 3, I have to divide all of the other side by 3. So now t is on its own, it's equal to s minus 4 all over 3. Yeah. Yeah? You just leave it like that and it's fine. Okay, right, just to summarise what we've covered today. We've derived formula, we've substituted values into formula, and we've changed subjects of formula. Substitution and changing subjects have processes. The hardest thing to teach is this. What we're going to move on to now is this arguments bit. So, algebraic arguments. An algebraic argument is basically showing somebody is wrong by proving they're wrong with an example or by using algebra to say it's got to be this. Here's a, a nice simple example of an algebra, algebra by proving somebody's wrong by giving an example. So John states that whenever you square a number, the result is always even. Okay? And it's saying give an example to prove he's wrong. So how would you prove him wrong? Show that he's wrong. And how would we show that when you square a number it isn't even? Good, a power of two. two. So uh, any number that multiplies by itself that doesn't give an even number. So what numbers do that then? Three. Three, brilliant. Because three squared, that's what three squared, that's what we call squaring a number, means three times three. Three times three is nine. Okay. So I wasn't giving you anything difficult here. I was just trying to show you can win an argument by giving them an example where they're wrong. Okay. So this guy, John, is saying, whenever you square a number, you always get an even answer. And you come back and you say, no, if I square three, three threes are nine, that's odd. So your argument is wrong. Yeah, you're wrong. See what I mean? So in the most basic sense of the words, you can win an argument by proving somebody's wrong by giving them an example. Okay? So that's one for you to have a look at. Just see if you can win the argument. So Liz says that m cubed, does everybody know what m cubed means? So m cubed, what does that mean? Good, m times m times m, and then add two is never a multiple of three. What's multiples of three? What does the word multiple mean? What a multiple. Three, six, Good. Nine. It's your times tables. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, and so on. So I want you to prove Liz wrong. So Liz says that m cubed plus two is never a multiple of three. Give an example to show she's wrong. One. One. What's one times one times one? One. One. And what's plus two? Three. She says m cubed plus 2 is never a multiple of 3. So is 3 a multiple of 3? Yeah. 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 So you've won the argument even before you've had to think too hard. So think unit 2, think the answer can't be that difficult. Okay. Here's two more for you. 
Give an example to show three consecutive numbers with an even sum. Give an example to show three consecutive numbers with an odd sum. So the first one, talked about this yesterday, what are consecutive numbers? Good. So just pick three consecutive numbers for me. One, two, three. One, two, three. So it says pick three consecutive numbers and show that the sum of the numbers is even. So what's the sum of the numbers? Six. Six. Yeah? Remember yesterday we said they will use words like sum and difference and product. That's how they put it into words where you have to derive things. Okay? You have to know what they're asking for. So give an example to show three consecutive numbers with an odd sum. So if these three make an even sum, what do you think I need to start with to get an odd sum? Four, five, six. Good. Four, five, six. So if I start with an even number, so what's the sum of those three? Good. Yeah? So what they're saying is, if you start with an odd number and have three consecutive numbers, you will end up with an odd number, uh, sorry, an even number at the end. If you start with an even number, three consecutive numbers, you end up with an odd one at the end. Okay. Now, what we're going to move on to now is slightly trickier. It's tricky because to win the arguments now, giving an, one example isn't good enough. They want to know something is always the case. And generally, these questions involve odd or even numbers. And the way to win the argument is to use the words odd or even in the formula or expression that they're giving you. Okay, so we'll do this with an example now. You'll do a couple of examples. So W is an even number, and they usually put it in block capitals and italics, so you know what they're talking about. Explain why three brackets W plus one will always be odd. Okay, so W is even. So if you want to use a number just to get it into your head what they're doing, we say W is even. So let's make W two. So 2 plus 1 is 3. The 3 next to that means I multiply it by 3, so I end up with 9. Okay? That doesn't get you a mark in the exam. That's just an example of that. Okay? The way to get the marks in the exam when you end up with these odd and even type questions is to put the word in here instead of W. So I know it sounds daft, don't put a number in there put the word in. So even goes for W. So if I have an even number and I add 1, what do I always get? An odd. Yeah? So what you do in the exam is you say an even number plus 1 will always be odd. Can you see what we've done there? It doesn't matter what the number is. An odd number times 3 will always give me what? Odd. And this is the thing that gets you the mark in the exam, this thing. So what I want you to do is have a go at that one, okay? So W is an even number. Explain why W squared plus one will always be odd. So what have we written then to, to get our marks for this? Even yeah, a better way of writing it is even times even, which is your even squared. That's what that means, yeah? So I, I'd write it in longhand. An even times an even, which is what even squared is, gives you even. an even. And then plus one will give you odd. Did everyone get that? So that's what they're after for the mark. Have another go. So you're into the swing of it. So just do that one. What have we got? We've got odd, times odd. odd squared is odd Equal. times odd, which gives me an... So what happens odd. when I... Odd. Yeah? So odd times odd is an odd, and then I add one, one and I get even. even. Good. Right. Just going to make it slightly harder for you now. This is from an exam. Okay, so question 10 in the exam, quite far into the exam. Have a go at that. So what are we going to do here then? Put even. Good. Mm. Even, even plus 1 equals even. Odd. 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 Yeah. Even minus 1. Even 
minus 1 is an odd. So we've got an odd in there and an odd in there. And because they're next to each other, an odd times by an odd is odd. Do one in your head. If, if, you, if you're worried you've not got the right thing, once you've done this, put some numbers underneath it. So if I've got 2, let's make the even number 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. 2 minus 1 is 1. 3 times 1, 3. Yeah? So don't be frightened of doing an example as well underneath it, just to make sure what you're doing is correct. Yeah? But if you're happy, this is what gets you the marks. My course. Everything from yesterday's lesson and today's lesson is on my course. The YouTube video will be on YouTube by Sunday afternoon.